Hello and welcome to the Armin Show. Science, people, creativity, learning more. Glad to have you all on here. Subscribe if you haven't on YouTube and all the platforms. We're always learning things. On this episode, we have the author, a professor, the author of this wonderful book, Scotland. It's by Professor Murray Pittock, and it's the global history of Scotland from 1603 to the present. We have today Professor Murray Pittock on the show. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much for asking me, Armin. I'm very glad to have you on. And your book, I would put in the category of a substantial book, a pinnacle, if you will, in a category which I've thought of, of some books that if they really cover a topic in full detail, such that you would get full understanding of some topic, yours would be in that category. And that's very valuable to many people who would read it. Now, I would like to point out that you are the professor of literature at the University of Glasgow and pro vice principal at the university. And you have served in senior roles, including dean and vice principal since 2008. You have passed books, including Culloden, Enlightenment in a Smart City, The Myth of the Jacobite Clans, and Robert Burns in Global Culture. This is wonderful. Now, as a Scottish historian, my first question for you is, what kind of inspiration do you get from Scotland? Before we go into the book, what kind of inspiration does it give you as a nation or as a people? Well, no question that it's easier to be a Scottish historian if you are, if you, uh, are from Scotland, I think. But uh, um, it's difficult to say whether it's, it's really a matter of, of uh, the inspiration of the country. But I guess that I, as I grew up um, and traveled elsewhere, I became aware of the distinctiveness of Scotland's culture and uh, uh, driven by a, a long-standing curiosity to get to the bottom of that, which was also intensified by the fact that I grew up in a particular region of Scotland, which isn't taken to be typical of its culture, but is actually a, uh, has an important contribution to make to that culture, that is Aberdeenshire in the northeast of Scotland. This is true. Now, informationally, I would like to mention that two years ago, I did go to Scotland for about a month. I was in Glasgow for a few weeks, and I also went to Edinburgh and above there, a little bit St. Andrews and the universities. I like it very much, and I felt a lot of refreshing nature, intelligence, and there's a bit of a grit to it that was described by individuals there, and I felt it. I like that grit feature. And as I was reading your book, I related much more with Scotland than I did before. I didn't understand why, but now I understand why I connect more with Scotland than some other countries. So I found that to be informative. When you think of Scotland, what are some of the key areas that come to mind for its development? What cities are the real items that come to mind first for Scotland's development? Well, uh, one of the things that distinguishes Scotland uh, in terms of its cities is that the four largest cities in Scotland today were the four largest cities in Scotland in 1500. And that's not true of a lot of countries. Uh, I mean, if you think about how cities in the States, uh, like Phoenix, have rocketed up in population or Atlanta uh, in the last 30 or 40 years, uh, uh, to find uh, that um, Scotland's large cities were always Scotland's large cities is over half a millennium is rather different. But the point is, it's not just because it's not just for the sake of these being the largest cities. Uh, it's because uh, it's because uh, you mentioned universities; uh, they developed institution educationally and institutionally at a very early period. As they developed education institutionally, they were also because they were big civic centers, major centers for uh, networking and uh, regional and institutional loyalties. So you got developing a set of sometimes interlocking, but certainly regional networks within Scotland, which were based both on um, family and uh, area, regional area you came from, but also on the institutions that you shared the schools and uh, sometimes the universities that you shared. And uh, that you tended to help 
people from that network first and you helped people from other networks in Scotland second. Uh, but you did, but, uh, but the point was that there was a very strong institutional backbone. Uh, Scotland had uh, a, larger a larger proportion per capita of university places for the population than anywhere else in uh, Europe in the 18th century. And that has a sig had a significant, only one of the features that had a significant effect Another was that, in, that that people at the major institutions outside the universities, for example, the Faculty of Advocates, often themselves studied not only at Scotland's universities but also abroad, so that the the domestic regional networks are reinforced uh, from a very early stage by international networks. I like to mention the institutions. There's a theme of that throughout the book. I visited the University of Glasgow. I liked it very much. I've speak, spoken with uh, Lee Cronin in there uh, in the chemistry department. Wonderful individual. And may yeah, speak yeah. with him in the future again. And you can feel the knowledge from within. Now, going into the history that you started with in the book, you started way early on in 1603 is where you made the cutoff. What happened right at that time and why there is the beginning point for Scottish history? Well, I, 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 it's it's not the beginning point for Scottish history. First of all, it's the beginning point for this Scottish history because the because the book could have been four times the size. But um, the reason for choosing sixteen oh three is twofold. First of all, it's the point at which James the Sixth of Scotland ascends to the English throne, and there is an initial regnal union uh, between the kingdoms of England and Scotland, not the union that subsequently followed in seventeen oh seven but a union, uh, a monarchical union of two separate kingdoms. And because that uh, uh, the Thirty Years' War, uh, which was the, the most devastating war in Europe until the modern period that raged from 1618 to 1648, was critical for the military projection of Scotland uh, abroad and also for the military projection of Scotland in the British Isles because a lot of those who came back to fight in the wars against, between uh, King and Parliament in the 1630s and 40s, were those, 1640s, were those with um, experience in the Thirty Years' War, in which uh, 100,000 Scots fought, nine-tenths of them on the Protestant side. You mentioned early on the differences in one part of Scotland being more, I believe, Episcopalian in North and East and Presbyterian South and West. How did that differentiation happen in the first place? Uh, fundamentally, um, the East Coast ports were strongly influenced by uh, the Lutheran Reformation because of their trading relationships with uh, Northern Germany uh, or the Northern, the Northern state, Germanic states, the Holy Roman Empire. And so uh, they, they tended to receive more Lutheran influence than the primarily Presbyterian Reformed influence that was injected by John Knox and his followers into the South and West. But also, they were basically what the historian Gordon Donaldson called the conservative North. That is, that quite a lot of Catholics who didn't particularly want not to be Catholics, but didn't actually want to be prosecuted, persecuted, and hunted down either, became Episcopalians. And, uh, 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 and that therefore a, a grouping in the Episcopalian church developed in the late 17th century, which was uh, quite Catholic in outlook. The interesting thing, of course, is that um, uh, the American Episcopalian church is a daughter church of the Scottish Episcopalian church and not the Church of England because its first, bi its first bishop, Seabury, was consecrated in Aberdeen by Scottish Episcopalian bishops for the very simple reason that at that time they owed no allegiance to George III, that their allegiance was to the Stuarts in exile. And therefore, for the Americans, for, for the Americans to take uh, Episcopalian orders, um, they couldn't take it them from an Anglican bishop because of the sovereignty of the involvement of George III's role as Supreme Governor of the Church of England. So it's an interesting it's an interesting quirk that the American Episcopal Church is the daughter church of the Scottish Episcopal Church. I like how you bring up various links between a, a country and 
where the original roots came in for education or religion or whatever it might be. And you mentioned England there. There's quite a bit. I got a little bit sad reading the early part of the book, thinking about the relationship between Scotland and England and how it started off. How would you describe how the dynamic developed such that they are, you said it in the book somehow, that they are somewhat connected, but not completely disconnected, have some sovereignty, but it's almost like you're not exactly with us. How would you describe that initial buildup of relationship? Well, what I tried to do in the early st- look to do in the early stage of the book is to explain um, different concepts of sovereignty. One of the problems, and it's a problem which is shared by the interpretation put forward uh, by Henry Kissinger and the interpretation put forward in the UK as well, with the with the Peace of Westphalia, which ended the Thirty Years' War. One of the problems with that is it's supposed to create the idea of the modern sovereign state, and that's because most of the people who interpret it. Uh, in politics, uh, academics, diplomats, and so on, do so within an Anglo-American framework. And an Anglo-American framework is very used to the notion of sovereignty, parliamentary sovereignty, the sovereignty of the American people, you know, whatever. You, sovereignty is a very, sig- a, a, a very straightforward and singular concept. Uh, but actually, uh, sovereignty was mixed at Westphalia well, the, the treaty at Westphalia was, was meant to establish the boundaries of sovereignty within the confederation of the Holy Roman Empire. What I try to do is explain that confederal, confederal states, that is states with independent entities within them, but with a single figurehead quite often, in the, in the case, for example, the Holy Roman Empire, the emperor, uh, are a really a very important way in which sovereignty is conceived uh, 300, 200, and even 100 years ago, you think of the uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, um, which is all, which is a confederal, which is a confederal state. So, partly we don't we don't really understand now. Looking at it through an Anglo-American prism, we don't understand the way in which sovereignty was thought of in the 17th century. And Scotland's relationship with England was originally that kind of confederal relationship. When a full-scale parliamentary union took place in 1707, it became a closer relationship. But because of the constitutional nature of that union and the separation within it of crown rights from parliamentary rights, Scotland became one state with England for the purpose of parliament, but it didn't become one state uh, with England for the purpose of either the crown or its institutions. And particularly the institution, I mean, for example, uh, the law is a crown institution in Scotland and remained uh, independent. Scotland's institutions and crown patronage within those institutions often remained uh, uh, independent. And so Scotland, uh, even before uh, devolution in the modern era, functioned as a quasi-autonomous entity within the British Empire. One of the interesting things about that is the level of tolerance uh, um, uh, that was shown by England to the creation of Scottish associations you'll be familiar with in the United States. I'm very fond myself of the St. Andrew's Society of San Francisco, who are just having their barn supper shortly. But um, but these organizations were allowed to grow up. Nobody tried to infiltrate them, shut them down or whatever. And they grew up with a particular aim of benefiting Scots, supporting Scots, and often, particularly in areas like Southeast Asia, getting Scots into jobs at the expense of English people. Um, but nobody objected to them. And they actually became one of the engines, not the only, but one of the key engines for the imprint of Scotland across the world as a separate national entity within the British Empire. I like that you mentioned the imprints of where their concepts were spread to wherever it might be later on to other places, maybe Caribbean, United States, wherever it is. One thing that comes to mind is what were some of the strengths early on that England had and then that Scotland had uh, strengths and and weaknesses that helped to uh, build the position that they ended up in as a pairing? Well, Scotland is is um, has its own history and is a different country, but it's not it's not necessarily a nice country full of nice people all the time. So um, in the, uh, 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 there's no moral superiority being claimed for Scotland. So the 17th century, Scotland was trying to get an overseas empire in the same way as uh, the Netherlands, as Portugal, as England. 
But then it's a two problems. One was that England was not really allow, uh, uh, allowing it to piggyback on uh, England, and it wouldn't, and England wouldn't protect any uh, attempts by Scotland to gain its own colonies. And uh, Scotland couldn't, neither had the money, nor uh, partly affected by the climatic shifts in what's generally somewhat misleadingly called the Little Ice Age, um, made, made Scotland poorer than it had been in the medieval period, comparatively. Uh, it, so it lacked money and it lacked force. And both Portugal and the Netherlands had a lot of money, by comparison, uh, 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 and a lot of force. They could project military and economic power to protect their trading relationships and their colonial relationships, and Scotland couldn't do this. So fundamentally, from the point the matters came to a head with the Darien scheme, which uh, Scotland again visionary but couldn't afford couldn't fund it, uh, saw the Isthmus of Panama as a key area which could become a trading entrepot for both the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, and set up a colony there at Darien with a small problem that that was that was New Spain and that was Spanish held land. And uh, within, after a, 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 a brief resistance, within 18 months, the, Sp the Spaniards drove them off and uh, England had, did, had done nothing to support them in the interim. So that the economic crisis that followed on from that helped, that was by no means the only reason, helped to push Scotland towards, or the Scottish elites, towards uh, a union with England, which would allow the primary purpose of which was not to become one country with England, the primary purchase of, purpose of which was to gain access to English markets protected by English troops and the Royal Navy for, Scot for Scottish merchants. So the great strength that England had was brawn and the great strength that Scotland had was brains and adaptability, not suggesting that England didn't have brains as well, but the adaptability was key because since the medieval period, Scots had done very well integrating with other cultures. And they were able to do that with a whole range of cultures, ranging from the Netherlands to First Nations people in Canada. So uh, the, the, the ability of Scots to integrate and to get the best out of their hosts, rather than to treat them arrogantly or be dismissive towards them, although that, of course, happened, is a key element in Scots' success in the British Empire. I like that you mentioned adaptability. It makes me think of how many evolutionary biologists are from Scotland and an understanding <laughs> of <laughs> Yes, absolutely. <laughs> There's a strong link there of we have to figure things out. Okay, what's the step? This is what we're working with. Adjust. And they say one of the biggest factors of intelligence is adaptability or how you respond to what's happening. So I put that high on the totem pole there. Well, exactly. So we're in bed with an we're in bed with an elephant. So you have to know, <laughs> you have to stay awake. That's true. There's an elephant in our bed right now. Right. You have to always be a dead. It, I, think, I think it's the most important. It's like the most important human quality is responsiveness and how you adjust to the moment because things can be straightforward, but that's not interesting and there's no story mm -hmm. there. It's almost purposeless in a way. So having a response to what is there, I feel is very valuable. You mentioned Spain right there. Can you describe a little bit of the interlinking between Scotland and Spain for dominance? And then after that, maybe we can go to France, because I noticed these two came up quite a bit. Yes, so um, Scotland, Scotland's interlinking with Spain is, generally speaking, uh, if not uh, neutral, uh, a negative one uh, for most of the 18th century, largely on religious confessional grounds. Because although France was Catholic, um, Spain was ultra Catholic by comparison. Nonetheless, there was uh, there was uh, a Scottish regiment, the Edinburgh uh, Regiment, in the Spanish service, and principally Jacobites, exiled supporters of the Stuarts who opposed the Union, uh, were those who were involved in the Spanish service. In the early 19th century, Scott, uh, well, one Scot in particular and his, his um, Scottish allies, Cochrane, uh, the future Earl of Dundonald, uh, became uh, the liberator of Chile, and Bra of Chile from Spanish and Brazil from Portuguese rule. 
so there is quite a clash between um, the uh, 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 between uh, the Scots and uh, Spaniards and Portuguese in nineteen in early nineteenth century Latin America, uh, but uh, Scotland's Scotland's basic position vis-a-vis -vis Spain was one of was one of contestation. It was very different with France, where there was a long-standing alliance and even a temporary regnal union between Scotland and France uh, under the marriage of Francis II uh, of France to Mary Queen of Scots. How much of the allying or competition between the nations is based on their environmental dynamics or uh, cultural details or religion, and how much of it is uh, key figures or leaders dictating this is what we would you would do? How would you weigh those? Well, it's mostly about religion and structural power. For example, although people associate the term the empire on which the sun never sets uh, with the British Empire, it was actually used first of Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, who was also uh, who, uh, whose dominions, including the Spanish dominions, extended uh, from the Philippines to Germany. So um, the, we're, we're looking at a situation where Spain is an enormously powerful, if actually quite early fading, colonial power, and it's also regarded as ultra-Catholic. In those circumstances, and also because of the relative lack of engagement with uh, Scots, uh, with Spain in the uh, uh, in earlier centuries, uh, Scotland was never going to be positive. That's a, a, a positively engaged with Spain, who of course drove Scotland out of Darien. So that was that's simply a matter of religious circumstance combined with history, uh, strong religious divisions combined with a lack of joint history. Um, but as I said, the case with France is the, the case with France is significantly different, which is not to say that the Reformation did not put um, uh, a degree of strain on the on the Scoto French relationship. Scotland's primary relationship with, with was with France before 1560. Uh, by the 17th century, its primary relationship was with the Netherlands, and that was largely based on confessional issues. Earlier, you had men mentioned the Jacobites, and they come up quite a bit early on in the book. Can you describe their purpose, how they developed, and what came of them? So the Jacobites are the um, the uh, supporters of the exiled King James the Seventh and Second, who was uh, Seventh of Scotland, Second of England, who was driven off his throne by William of Orange's uh, invading force in late 1688 and uh, and attempted to regain his thrones in Ireland uh, um, in until 1691 and in Scotland until a similar date. So initially, James was uh, excluded because of a fear among uh, elites, principally in England, but also in Scotland of uh, Catholic tyranny. Because he was a Catholic, he was a, he he was a, he was an adult convert. But both he and his brother Charles II had been strongly exposed to Catholicism in exile in the 1650s. And um, Charles II died a Catholic, and how long he was one is a moot point. But James publicly converted. So um, the Jacobites supported his line as legitimate line. The Stuarts were. In an age when legitimacy of kingship meant a great deal, the Stuarts were the legitimate heirs of every um, British dynasty. They were recognised as the heirs of the High Kings of Ireland and Ireland. They were recognised as the heirs of the House of Bruce and of Malcolm Canmore in Scotland. They were, through the niece of Edward the Confessor, the heirs of the House of we the Saxon House of Wessex in England. They were also the senior heirs of the House of Plantagenet and Tudor and they were naturally the senior heirs of the House of Stuart. So they were completely, in every respect, the only legitimate monarchs, for those who thought that way, of the three kingdoms. But the issue became more pronounced from the 1690s onwards, and particularly from 1707, because James's, James set up Parliament in Ireland, and the Irish Parliament 
repealed a significant amount of anti-Catholic legislation and anti what you might call anti-Irish legislation in, in 1691. Uh, and James, we don't, it's not absolutely clear how many of those bills he actually agreed. I think there were 11 bills. Um, but James became associated and the Jacobites became associated uh, and indeed were anyway to a degree with the restoration of Catholic rights in Ireland and with Irish sovereignty. And after 1707, where the union which they opposed with Scotland, they, um, James wanted to solve the problem of Scotland not getting access to England's colonies by having a protected trading relationship between Scotland and England. Uh, so he wanted to solve these matters a different way, and he didn't want to have a union of the kingdoms, and he got more and more against it as he got older. Um, so he, he died before the union took place, but his son was of equal, equally of that mind. And so the fact was that if you were a, a Scottish, uh, uh, it's a bit, a bit, a bit out of um, anachronistic to use the term nationalist, but if you were a Scottish patriot who wanted a sovereign Scotland back, and if you were an Irish patriot who wanted a Catholic Ireland back in the 18th century, your options were to support the Jacobites. And that was it, really. You had no other option. So that was that. The, it wasn't. It, it began as a legitimist issue about whose whose throne is it, but its strength and its, uh, in fact, global footprint depended on the fact that actually it had a very different vision for the way the British Isles polity would develop. One in which there would be three separate kingdoms under a single monarch, rather than a unified a, a, a unified monarchy with Parliament passing um, certainly anti-Irish and possibly anti-Scottish legislation. That kind of legislation would not be supported by them. I want to add in, in the book, you showcase that there is, I believe, Jacobite tartan. There is Edinburgh tartan. There's different kinds of tartan, which I didn't know I, there was only one. And uh, this is a tartan once given to me by Mary Rose Mullen, who's been on the show before. She's a costume designer at Scottish Ballet in Glasgow. She's there right now. Wonderful oh, yeah. person. She's been on the show. Um, can you speak on the different kinds of tartan, the history of it? And I thought there was only one before your book. <laughs> there was just tartan, um, but then there was different ones. So um, one of the uh, tartan um, probably has a very long history but it starts to emerge in a differentiated form in the 16th century. And uh, it, we have certain tartans that we associate with uh, the Scottish royal family in the 16th century and with certain of the great families of Scotland. Uh, Maclean, I think, is a 16th, uh, has a 16th century tartan. So there are some family tartans before the 19th century in the 19th century, in order to <clears throat> sell more tartans than ever before, uh, Wilsons of Bannockburn and uh, a number of uh, a number of their antiquarian supporters uh, devise a whole complex system of Scottish clan and family tartans, most of which are false, or at least have got very, very doubtful links to the actual families they describe, and they miss out certain families altogether. For example, Curry and Turnbull don't get a tartan until much later. Um, so, but, so but the, there's been a process up to that point. The tartan was associated with Scottish patriotism and it became the badge of the Jacobites. The Jacobites uniformed all their armies in tartan. Only the French regulars refused to wear tartan. Even the Manchester Regiment in 1745 had got a tartan sash. So tartan was the badge of the Jacobites because of its links to Scottish patriotism. It was there. It was it was effectively banned. At least the Highland dress was banned in public from 1746 onwards by the British Parliament, with the sole exception of it of its be its use in the British Army. So you could wear tartan in the British Army, but you couldn't wear it in civil society because it was the sign of Scottish patriotism. So in the British Army, it then becomes the sign of Scottish patriotism within the British Empire. And, and it's not until actually the end of World War II and beyond that kilts start to disappear 
from Scottish soldiers' uniforms in the British Army. Um, but one of the things you get in the 19th century then is the strong associate is the, the, the kilt. And if you see an evening dress with a kilt, it's still quite militaristic. There's a very strong militaristic vibe to a Prince Charlie jacket, for example, uh, um, with its um, uh, its uh, its uh, officer pips uh, on the on the wrists and on the shoulders and so on. So anyone wearing a tux with a Prince Charlie jacket looks like an army an army man, but isn't necessarily obviously. But uh, but that that military identity was linked also with a with the growing association of it of, of people of unquestioned family. So it became a badge of locality and uh, and of breeding, if you like, you know, good breeding. You're really an important person. You've come from this family. Your 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 antecedents are impeccable. You're a Scotsman, a, a kind of ethnic. But it became an ethnic badge with a military tinge, like um, the badge. And so it was used, for example, in the Great Diamond Jubilee celebrations in 1897. Scots, it's kind of it's a local dress, rather like the dress of the Maori in New Zealand. It's um, it marks out a Scot. But of course, actually, the kilt. Had really, and the tartan had really been, a, although it had had family associations, it had been more about uh, regions and loyalty and wider institutional and personal associations than it had been about whether you're really entitled to wear the McKeon tartan because, you're, because your father was one. And so in the modern era, association tartans have come back in a big way. And uh, family tartans, although still very prominent, how aren't as important as they were 40 years ago. And the idea that people aren't wearing a proper tartan, which was widespread in Scotland when I was a boy, you know, you're not, you're not entitled to wear that, Sonny. You know, there are only a few universals you could wear, like Royal Stuart uh, and Black Watch, which was, of course, the, 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 the regimental tartan of the Fighting 42nd. Uh, and there were one or two others. But otherwise, you had to be entitled to wear now we've moved away from that again, and people wear tartans that they are associated with. But that actually takes us back to the period of the of the Jacobite era. And, for example, you mentioned it, the Edinburgh pattern tartan of 1713. Wearing that was a sign of Jacobite loyalty. It didn't mean you were related to Edinburgh. Edinburgh doesn't have any children. Um, so yeah, uh, so it was, a, it was a badge of association and loyalty. And that's what it's become again. Um, and uh, there's been, yeah, that's it. There's the Edinburgh Tartan. That's Jacobite 1713 pattern. And it's now available. It's now available once more. You can buy it. So that anyone who wants to, to be a contemporary uh, reference to a reference uh, Jacobite loyalty in a contemporary frame can do that by buying the Tartan. I like that you bring up the associations connected. When I was there, I went to Drummond Castle Gardens, and then I didn't take much note of it. And then the name Drummond, I recently heard of, and then I saw it many times in your book. And you see the link of, let's say, the family. And I'm sure there's other uh, very formidable families that their structure has lasted for uh, generations. It's almost like your supporters or your group. Same thing with the design is the link to your individuals. It's almost like your team over time. So I like that. It's a way of showing a lineage in a way. Now, one thing that comes to mind is um, locations uh, that uh, important qualities that built up Scotland's energy. One is the oceans, the power on the waters, uh, boats, steamboats, things like that. And early on, you talk about the different views that countries had on managing the control of the sea. There was Moray Closum, which is a closed sea, and Moray Liberum, which was a free sea open to all to trade. Can you speak on where Scotland was on that and where it is today? Well, in, in the medieval period, Scotland rather favored a Moray Closum because it didn't want people poaching its fish. So um, it tried to, it, it, it tried to exert um, uh, and with considerable success in that period, naval power on the seas to prevent its fish being poached. Um, but it, uh, it, in the 17th century, it moved increasingly close to the Dutch position, which is Mare Liberum, 
uh, they opened the free trading sea. And part of the reason Scotland did that basically is uh, uh, for it, that was the only game in town because people who supported Mary Clausum in an age of transatlantic empires were the powers that could put big fleets on the seas to enforce control of the maritime sphere. If you couldn't do that, you were bound to support free trade without, without power because you didn't have any. So um, it was, uh, 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 or you didn't have enough. I mean, the Netherlands had quite a bit of power. They didn't have quite enough. So, um, so the belief in Mara, in Mara Liberum grew in the 17th century, basically as a corollary to Scotland's trading ambitions, which were at this stage increasingly stymied uh, by uh, the fact that it couldn't project enough money or power overseas to sustain them. Mm -hmm. The importance of sea control was very big early on, is very noticeable. And also there were many conflicts at that time over the sea or over land. Another location that I had gone to was the Inver, which is near um, Lachlan. There's Castle Lachlan and that area. There's a, a lake and there were battles near there. And the a big battle that was mentioned in the book was the Battle of Culloden, which has a big effect on Scottish history and its direction. Can you tell us what happened at the Battle of Culloden and how that shifted the way things well, went? Well, the Jacobite Rising of 1746, um, uh, which was the most serious threat to the British state in the 18th century, came to an end at uh, Culloden. And uh, it was defeated. The, the Jacobite army was um, defeated by the Duke of Cumberland with considerable uh, degree of atrocities following the battle because, frankly, the British army were extremely frustrated at having um, had such difficulty in overcoming the Jacobite insurgency. And as often happened in the moment of victory, they took it out on the people who'd given them such a hard time. Um, so that was very important. But, the, but what was important about Culloden was be, went far beyond the battle itself. Uh, and I just take two examples of what was important. First of all, it had a great deal of influence in framing British military doctrine, particularly the doctrine around transplantation of populations. So the removal of the Acadian of the Acadians, uh, the French native settlers from uh, British North America, from Maine to Nova Scotia in 1755-7, that was basically because the British army couldn't do that in Scotland. They wanted to but they couldn't do it because the politicians, uh, because there was a union, couldn't treat Scotland as a colony and had to say, well, actually, these people are subjects of the crown. You can't just take 10,000 of them and send them to the, irrespective of trying them in the courts or finding they're guilty of anything, to the Caribbean, you know, so that they'll catch something and die or to North America or anywhere. You just can't do it. But they, but the British, uh, but uh, but the doctrine was formulated, and it was applied in Acadia. It, had, I mean, it probably had actually had a, a life before Culloden, and but, but but nonetheless, the frustration after Culloden crystallized it. And probably the last example of that is the removal of the Chagos Islanders in 1973, um, for the purpose of handing over Diego Garcia as a U.S. Army base. So, uh, um, a U.S. Air Force base, sorry. So, actually, <laughs> that the the um, the shadow of Culloden is a very long one in terms of the military pop military policy and the transplantation of populations. But it was important in another way too, because although if the Jacobites had won at Culloden on on the day, they probably wouldn't. Oh, well, they wouldn't have won the uh, the rising. They would, in the end, have been overcome. Had that rising actually been successful, had the Jacobites been restored, then an awful lot of things might well have been different. For example, uh, the critical war with France, 1756-63 war with France, would not have taken place in all probability because the Stuarts were an awful lot more friendly to the French uh, than, their, than the alternative dynasty were. Um, and because it's, if it didn't take place, then there would still have been French Canada joined to the Louisiana territories and the U and the American colonies would have had significant problems 
with launching a revolt in 1775-6 because they would have had a large Catholic army uh, represent in French Canada to the immediate north of them. And there would have been a severe risk unless they, they pre-contracted to have an alliance with France, which eventually came. But there would have been a severe risk to the success or indeed the prospect of launching uh, the American Revolution. And France became grossly uh, indebted and overextended as a consequence of losing in 1756-63. And if it hadn't done, they would probably have been able to stave off the agricultural crises of the 1780s, which led to the French Revolution. And if they'd staved off the French Revolution, there would have been no Napoleon. So you see where we're going with this. It makes a huge difference if the Stuarts are restored in 1746. It's not very likely. It was always an outside chance but it could have changed the course of history. That's what's at stake at Culloden. What a fork in the road that can be. One thing that comes to mind is you just mentioned the doctrine that the, I think, English had. And it makes me think of uh, documentation that countries have written that other countries have used for their purposes. You had mentioned in the book that possibly the Declaration of Arbroath was a inspiration for the Declaration of Independence. Can you speak on any other or any countries using uh, Scottish efforts for their own, like as an example for their own creations? So I think, uh, um, I suppose there are quite a lot of cases. And uh, uh, the, I mean, I have to say that, or that whether or not the Declaration of Independence rather than the th the Enlightenment thoughts of Hutchinson and others is involved, uh, the American Constitution is a very good uh, is a very good example. Um, and uh, uh, but there are other examples in terms of um, uh, uh, particularly not so much the Constitution, but Scotland's education system, its university education system, uh, uh, is the basis of the education system, not only in the United States, at least the Scottish education system as it stood in the 18th century, but also in Canada and uh, Australia and elsewhere. It became the, the education system became the preferred system worldwide. And sometimes the Scottish flag was adopted. For example, Jamaica adopted the Saltar as the flag on the recommendation of, to President Bustamante of his friend who was a Scottish minister. So the reason there is a Saltar in the heart of the Jamaican flag is down to a simple Scottish influence. We're, we're putting it on the flag. That makes sense. I did notice, I, I noticed when I'm in Scotland or my connection to it, uh, Scottish ballet or a lot of the arts and culture, it passes on elsewhere. And like you said, with education, it seems like there's more arts in other systems because of Scottish individuals that came early on like you had said, in the Carolinas or Georgia or certain regions that has a large impact later on on because what it, what people are taught, then they um, have that in their viewpoints for the rest of their existence. So that's a large effect. Oh, and also how you had spoken about how there was even more education beyond Scotland within. It's almost like more education per capita than the people of Scotland. So it has to pass on to outside of the lands. Can you speak on how uh, Scotland got highly educated and had to even branch out some of their knowledge to elsewhere, like a cup overflowing. So um, Scotland developed a whole series of, first of all, of um, uh, grammar schools in the boroughs, in the, the, the towns and cities from the 12th century onwards. And by uh, the end of the 16th century had five universities, one of one of which Marshall in Aberdeen has subsequently merged with Kings to form the University of Aberdeen. So that's why there are only four ancient Scottish universities. But there were, technically speaking, five at the close of the 16th century. Um, from the beginning, there was a very close relationship between these institutions and the cities that hosted them. And the some of the major families linked to the uh, uh, living in and around those cities. And they became sources both of patronage and of networking for supplying Scots abroad, for supplying Scots abroad, because there were never enough opportunities for Scots at home, given the rate of production of um, graduates, and given that actually quite a lot of Scottish senior professional jobs went to people who'd also who graduated from universities outside Scotland. Um, 
So the the fundamental aspect of the Scottish curriculum of the Scottish curriculum that is um, sets it apart probably, uh, though it had a lot of influence from the Netherlands, which was really important in the 17th and 18th centuries, is that it's uh, even before the Enlightenment, it it displayed. Uh, the application of reason to knowledge in a context of material improvement. That is, there was an interest in the profession, there was an interest in professions, professional and vocational uh, study in Scotland to a greater extent than there was, for example, in Oxford and Cambridge contemporaneously, and to a, 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 and a great deal. They were much more, they were much more, both law and medicine were much more socially prestigious. Um, there was, uh, there was also an interest in philosophy as a tool to increase understanding of a wide range of subjects that weren't philosophy as a kind of intellectual enabler to 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 promote good reasoning and bad re uh, and uh, to avoid bad reasoning in a range of topics and uh, there was the development uh, driven partly by the need to um, integrate fully with uh, the british empire in a way which didn't disadvantage speakers of uh, Gaelic or particularly Scots to actually study uh, literature and belles lettres. So the rhetorical curriculum in Scotland, which was very, again, very instrumental, how do we persuade others, um, actually became, uh, uh, became uh, uh, turned into in Scotland uh, the, the foundational study of literature, the first chair of which in the world was founded in 1762 at Edinburgh. Um, and then became in fully integrated into literature and disappeared, except in some parts of the world which were influenced by Scottish education, like the United States, where speech remains, which was a recognizable Scottish subject in the 18th century, remains part of the curriculum of a, num uh, of a significant number of American higher educational institutions today. To agree, long live speech, by the way, that's true. It's very highly valuable and it does make it into, sometimes you'll have an after effect from something you do that it's no longer with you, but elsewhere yeah. where you passed it on, it develops unplanned to what you originally thought. Huh. Like, likewise, for example, um, uh, until recently anyway, Scots lawyers could go, could spend a year in their early career in Louisiana because uh, of the compatibility of the Code Napoleon in Louisiana state law with Scots law, which was better, which is so close to Roman law. That's interesting. It's like a link. Two items you mentioned there, they speak to me a lot, uh, vocational ability and also philosophical. Vocational, I had recently spoken with uh, Dr. Temple Grandin. She is a... Um, researcher here and is very focused on vocational material and movement of cattle and farming, things like that, things that are very trades oriented. And a lot of posts I've made about that have resonated highly because the trades and vocational um, support has gone down over the years mm. as people support things like programming or such instead of uh, elevators and developing mechanical ability, but it's highly needed. So that's, that's making a turnaround. That's one. And then to the philosophical item you bring up, so many wonderful philosophers, David Hume and others, come from Scotland. Uh, who comes to mind for you in the first place as far as philosophy from Scotland, and are there any themes that you notice? Well, um, one of the people that comes to mind is someone from before the beginning of the book. So it's uh, uh, so it's Dun Scotus, who um, from Duns in Berwickshire who died in Cologne in 1308 and is responsible for quite a number of uh, extraordinary uh, uh, intellectual contributions. One of the first of which is something which is more, uh, more uh, commonly associated with his, um, uh, I guess, apostolic successor as a, as a, as a Franciscan philosopher, William of Ockham, which is the non-multiplication of entities beyond necessity, uh, which first occurs in Scotus. And the second, a uh, second, and there may, there is quite a few more, is that in the Ordinatio he talks for the first time about uh, legitimate government arising from people being able to choose their own rulers, 
and there be able to, that, that not being a once a one off choice that the consent for rulers is renewable um and uh, as a as a concept in 1300 that is fairly extraordinary so um he is a very he is a, a, a scottish intellectual giant um and of course also a, a, a philosopher of freedom and the nature of, of freedom of the will, which is perhaps the thing he's most famous for. Obviously, Hume is in a different uh, spectrum too, and so in a way is Thomas Reed. But Thomas Reed's common uh, Thomas Reed's common sense philosophy, which in the nineteenth century transmuted itself into utilitarianism, which became known as the Scotch philosophy, uh, was basically is very Scottish in the sense that it's got to be useful. There's a there is an old joke about, I'm sure it's, it's used many times in other contexts, about a primary school boy in Aberdeen being given an essay to write, and their topic was the elephant. And he wrote down, the, there are 16 economic uses of the elephant, which are as follows. <laughs> so, so. It's all 16 of them. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> that is pretty good, actually. Yeah. I when I read you mentioned Dun Scotus in the book and I did look him up in fact and I like that concept I forgot there's another term for it but something has its essence and there's the simplest way there's another term for it but that you can describe it and as simple as it can be uh, keep it to that because that's the the main detail extra is unnecessary yeah it's very focus, important focus uh, is historically a great Scottish virtue. Mm -hmm. And then it made me think of, I don't know why the link to, uh, this is intellectual uh, resources. I noticed quite a bit of comparison or description of the physical resources uh, traded between countries. Can you speak on some of the items like tobacco or other uh, resources that were produced well or that uh, were involved in a lot of trade? So um, Scottish, Scottish networks took an enormous and immediate advantage of the union. And indeed, some of the, but through illegitimate trade, by, by um, faking having English crew members or by transferring stuff via Scottish ports to the English colonies, they'd been starting it before the union. They took immediate advantage of it. So by 1769, uh, Glasgow had 51% of the transatlantic tobacco trade. Uh, unfortunately, that went with, um, uh, although enslaved persons were not traded directly from Scotland to any degree, Scottish syndicates uh, owned quite a number of English slaving uh, port, uh, uh, companies, ports and ships. In fact, uh, John Gladstone, the Prime Minister's father, was the biggest recipient of um, compensation for uh, the abolition of slavery in the British colonies in 1832. And he, uh, he was from Fask and Aberdeenshire, but basically his, he owned uh, Liverpool, sla Liverpool slaving interests. And similarly, Scots were very prominent uh, in the Caribbean. And their prominence in the Caribbean and Chesapeake was one of the reasons that they effectively, they effectively resold sugar and tobacco to themselves or to their, you know, to their friends and contacts. They also developed, um, again, not altogether in a praiseworthy fashion. Um, the, uh, Benjamin Franklin was good friends with uh, 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 with uh, uh, Richard Oswald. Oswald, uh, part of um, well, the, the central part, perhaps, of Grant, Oswald and Co., had together with his his business partner Alexander Grant built up built up a huge conglomerate which ran everything from um, trading enslaved persons from Sierra Leone to uh, North America and the Caribbean, to supplying the entire British armed forces with food and drink, uh, of getting the sole contract in the 1756-63 war in the North American and some other theaters. So they effectively, uh, they effectively ran uh, munitions, food, supply, trading of enslaved persons all over the world. And it was Oswald who, uh, uh, who was the negotiator for Great Britain at the Peace of Paris which recognized American independence. And Benjamin Franklin, who thought he was a wonderful guy, sat next to him at, uh, at the dinner. Um, 
however, Oswald was not a particularly wonderful guy. He was an extremely effective businessman. And it's that degree of, uh, uh, and if you look at his relations, which are in the book, and the relations of his, his uh, business partner, Alexander Grant, a lot of them, a, a lot of his advantages come from, uh, the, from marrying Scots, uh, other Scots, from the relationships that they have between uh, in their own families and uh, uh, and uh, in terms of regional associations, North American linkages, huge numbers of Scots still in the mercantile communities of Northern Europe, which they're drawing on. It's a huge national international network, all of which is designed to make uh, this very successful slaver much richer. And that is, uh, for good and ill, the story of Scotland's 18th uh, Scotland's successful 18th century. The key issue is that from both India and the Caribbean, Scots repatriated money to Scotland more than they might have been expected to do otherwise. So the network loyalty helped to capitalize the Scottish Industrial Revolution and the development of early 19th century Scotland. Uh, in other words, um, some of the loot of empire, both human and um, material, has done a great deal or did a great deal 200 years ago for the Scottish economy. That was a surprising item to think of Scottish individuals as indentured servants, as was described in the book in some parts. So you wouldn't think of it that way, but that was a thing at the time for various individuals. My last question for you in this regard is in the past century, recent time, uh, what has been the main pushing forces of Scotland goals and uh, today, what might be the goal of Scotland moving uh, forward? Well, I think one of the things that's important for this is to realize is that is that um, people may look at Scotland now and wonder why has Scotland got a, a, an independence movement? Why has it got so much discontent uh, with the Union when everything was good for three centuries? And um, why now? Well, it's it's actually quite simple. A lot of it comes down to the instrumental issue again. Um, Scots saw the Union not as a meeting of minds or a turning into British people, but a way to get access to imperial markets. Of course, um, they supported the British ideal as an, as an international ideal. So in the same way as, and there are still Canadians who identify as British, but in the same way as people identified as Canadian and British, Australian and British, so people identified as Scots and British. But they saw it fundamentally as an international imperial identity. They didn't see it as the identity of a single island off the European mainland. Um, so when the empire came to an end, a huge uh, reason for the union disintegrated in front of the eyes of a number of quite a number of Scots, directly and indirectly. Um, so some of the work that I've done on, uh, on uh, Scottish schools, and of course I'm talking about relatively elite selective schools in the boroughs, but they could have up to 30 to 40 percent as late as the 1950s of their leavers could get jobs for some of their lives in the British Empire. It was a huge impact on a big section of society and a, and a section of thought leaders. So first of all, the, there's the, the, the British Empire's disappearance undermines the rationale for the Union. Secondly, and more uh, of more interest to, to non-elite Scots, is the way in which it, England um, compensates for the loss of empire by putting forward a narrative which starts actually before empire is lost. It starts at the Battle of Britain in 1940, it's when Britain, the Britain stood alone narrative, which focuses on the singularity and homogeneity and island nature of Britain as uh, the champion of uh, the champion of liberty, the home of parliamentary sovereignty. It becomes a very much more enclosed narrative of British homogeneity within one island, whereas before Britain spanned the world. And yeah, you could be Scottish and British, but you know you could be Indian and British. So um, 
that made a big difference. And it also meant that that um, the performance of Scottish culture and identity within Great Britain became much less pronounced and actually was regarded as, as dissenting from the new British ideal. And uh, that, that also, that, that led, first of all, to partly its... Um, its retreat, and then suddenly to its to its reflowering again, but in a particularly Scottish context, and increasingly associated with demands for changing constitutional status for Scotland, because the old the old uh, idea where um, Scots were completely uh, uh, semi autonomous cult autonomous culturally, semi autonomous institutionally, and only part of the British Empire politically. Have been replaced by actually one where they got to be, they're not, they're, they've got to be British, as if that's just one thing, not not a, a, a marvelous gallimaufry of different peoples, but just one thing, and that thing usually defined in London. So uh, that 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 lack of diversity in the understanding of the international nature of Britishness really changed the way in which Scotland was represented and accommodated within the within the UK. And that is an, another major driver towards change. In other words, it's not that Scots have changed so much as that the union has changed and the conditions under which the union was agreed and in which it was most popular no longer actually obtain. And that's been accentuated in recent years by leaving the European Union, which is the ultimate Britain is just one place argument doesn't need to share its sovereignty with anything. It's so powerful. Doesn't need to be friends with anyone, um, which basically has got very little traction indeed in Scotland because people think that that's just not the way things are. And of course, that isn't the way things are. But there are a lot of people who, who actually went for Brexit on the basis that that is the way things are. And um, I think they're now finding out how true that is. This is true. That's compelling right there. Professor Pittock, where might people look to your material? Where might you direct them to find your works? What would you say for that? Well, I, I, so, the, the, so first of all, um, Scotland, the global history is available, um, discounted from quite a lot of sites. Just putting that, putting the name of it into Google will get you um, plenty of discount uh, copies at discounted rates um but nearly all of the nearly all of my books are in print and available on amazon and other and other sites uh but uh fundamentally uh scotland the global history has i promise you got a lot in it and i think it also has quite a lot in it of, which is of interest to, uh, to american to americans both in terms of uh, scotland's relationship with them and also their own history I have to say, I don't often say it, but I will likely be reading, uh, rereading portions of the book because of the value presented there and the amount of detail there such that it gives you an all-encompassing view of Scotland over time. So that is highly valuable and a lot of credit to an individual that can put that all together in one package for people to take in. It's highly valuable, so I wanted to showcase that. Professor Pittock, I would like to say thank you for joining on this discussion of your great book, Scotland, The Global History, 1603 to the Present, informing a bit about what's happened these past over 400 years and guiding us into some of the philosophy, markets, battles, and locations important to Scotland and its connected allies and enemies. It's, it's, it's Mare but, and uh, Armin, but thank you so much for asking me on. And... Uh, and uh, I hope you have a, a lovely morning in Los Angeles. And I know one thing, which is it'll be a lot warmer than it is here because I can still see the snow outside. That is wonderful. <laughs> Long live Professor Murray Pittock. Thank you for coming on. And thank, thank you. Are out.